I'm Dr. Rick Forno, a, uh, the director of our graduate cybersecurity program here at UMBC and the assistant director of the UMBC Center for Cybersecurity. I've been at UMBC for about 10 years. I come from the cybersecurity industry. Um, I've been uh, the proverbial hands-on keyboard geek all the way through to a, a chief security officer for a company that during dot-com really was at the center of the internet. Uh, during my career, you know, I've kind of done it all, but one of my key areas or my interests and um, expertise, if you will, is in the area of um, incident response, incident handling, incident management. In other words, what happens when um, bad things happen, or as I say, what happens when things go boom? So this talk is going to talk a little bit about um, how we incorporate cybersecurity thinking into um, emergencies, not just cybersecurity related, but more broadly about um physical incidents like COVID-19, like disasters, like earthquakes. So this is going to be a fairly informal uh, conversation today, uh, talking about uh, cybersecurity concerns uh, in, in an emergency response uh, sense. Um, let's say my background is in incident handling, incident response. Um, I've been, I, I've done communications uh, unit building for hurricanes down in South Florida earlier on. I've coordinated large scale cybersecurity incidents and emergencies. Um, in corporate America. So as I say, incident response is pretty near and dear to my heart. Before I get started, I want to throw out a rhetorical question. Does anybody know what the witching hour is for people, uh, for first responders, regardless of, of industry? Does anybody have any idea what the uh, the witching hour is? The witching hour for most responders is five o'clock on a Friday afternoon. That is when things break. That is when major hacks take place. That is when things go to hell and we have to ruin our weekend plans to deal with the response. I can't count the number of weekends, both normal weekends and holiday weekends, where I have been brought into work because of major cybersecurity incidents. And the same applies to um, paramedics and emergency rooms at hospitals. Most of the time, incidents, um, uh, their busiest times are Friday and Saturday nights when people are out having fun, partying drinking and, and, and so forth. And that's usually the, the crunch time for the fire departments, uh, paramedics and uh, uh, emergency rooms. Um, so this talk is gonna be organized uh, in, around three key areas. <clears throat> Excuse me, firstly, we're gonna talk a little bit about some big picture thoughts about cybersecurity and um, how it fits into um, uh, emergencies and crisis management. Then I'm gonna move into um, giving some uh, operational thoughts, lessons learned from my career uh, and from what I've seen currently, uh, that might be useful in informing how you look at cybersecurity and incident response generally for your organizations, regardless of whether it is a cyber uh, incident or a more um, physical incident like, like, like a pandemic like we're experiencing now, and then open it up for some questions at the very end. So with that, let's dive right in. Cybersecurity is based around three general concepts, and this has governed our industry for at least the last 40 years. We call it the CIA triad, and that stands for the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. The confidentiality of information, the integrity of the information, meaning that it's not been altered or modified in any way, and the availability of that information, meaning you can get it, get the access to the information when you need it, um, as you need it. And that's really driven a lot of um, how this industry has evolved over the years. And really, our industry is based on these three fundamental tenets. Um, on a side note, I, I think that we tend to focus a lot on the confidentiality aspect, keeping secrets. We tend to um, outsource the availability to network operations and uh, folks like that. And we tend to marginalize the integrity. But in, in recent years, the integrity of information has really become far more um, in vogue and important when you consider things like fake news and social media and uh, the influence campaigns that we see plaguing the world. But that, putting that aside for a minute here, incident response, incident handling certainly started off is, um, you know, in, in the, the fire EMS sense. Uh, your house is on fire, there's a heart attack at home, uh, you know, you pick up the phone, you call 911 and responders will come and do what they do. And in a lot of ways, cybersecurity incident handling is the same, the same sort of thing. Um, I have a good friend who's, who's a, a career firefighter up in Pennsylvania, and he would say that being a fireman was hours of sheer boredom, followed by minutes of stark terror and seconds of amazing excitement. And that's actually pretty true, if you think about it. Cybersecurity, it, it, that really applies to cybersecurity as well, because much of our time is spent 
uh, doing analysis and audits and log file reviews and uh, uh, configuring systems to protect information and information assets. But then, and, and that's routine. It gets kind of boring after a while. But at some point, something bad happens. We get a surge of adrenaline and we go after the problem. So it's a very similar mindset and, and, and model uh, for cybersecurity incident response, just as it is for um, re incident response in, in, in the real world. Um, so it's very similar in that regard. A lot of times responders, again, of whatever stripe, um, prepare. You know, there are tabletop exercises, there are war games, uh, there are training courses and scenarios. But in all honesty, there's no substitute for actual live experience during an incident, either watching it or going through it firsthand. Former Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld had a great quote, and he said, there are, there are always known knowns, things that we know that we know, and there are things that we know we don't know. But what really worried him were the unknown unknowns, things that we don't know we don't know that are not foreseeable and will pop up when you least expect them, both as a matter of course and quite commonly during an incident or a crisis situation like what we're seeing today. Um, similarly, there's an old military um, adage that says, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. All the preparation, all the policies, all the procedures and processes we've developed um, are great. They get us to, a, to the gate, to a starting point. But once the incident unfolds, once the emergency takes place, those unknown unknowns start coming in, uh, into view. Um, that plan may need to be changed on the fly uh, based on the situation on the ground, based on your awareness of how things are evolving. Uh, so preparation is helpful, but it really only goes so far. But where it does help, is identifying gaps in your operational processes and particularly the resourcing of how you would respond to an incident. You, know, you schedule a drill, a cybersecurity drill or a pandemic response drill or a, a fire drill, and you see where the, um, there are gaps in your planning. Maybe you don't have enough people to provide appropriate 24 hour coverage. Maybe you don't have the right technical expertise uh, given the systems that you're charged with protecting. Maybe you only have Windows experts on your staff, but you really need some Unix experts. Uh, so preparation in that regard does help. The planning and the wargaming and the scenarios helps in that regard because it allows you to identify those gaps that if you can close them before the alarm goes off, will make your life as an incident responder a bit easier. Now let's just take a, a minute and think about the pervasiveness of technology in the emergency management, and the crisis management uh, chain. I'm thinking here from vendor to victim. Think about all the technology aspects that start from, let's say, a, a pharmaceutical company manufacturing a new, a new vaccine, uh, the data going into the research labs that then is used to for, uh, formulate uh, test drugs, um, the data that the test drugs uh, generate when administered to patients. Think about um, hardware, medical hardware, devices, um, the IoT, if you will, in the medical sense the data that goes into designing, let's say, a new pacemaker or a medical implant, uh, the security of that R&D data, all the way through the medical system to patient diagnoses, the, the, you know, the personal information of patients, uh, the results of patients to various uh, treatments, um, and, and, and so forth. Um, IT is everywhere. I mean, how many of us go to a doctor these days and we're not greeted by a doctor carrying a laptop or an iPad? Okay. That's the name of the game these days. Information is everywhere, and it's not just at the point of treatment. It's all the way back through the system, uh, through, through, as I say, this chain from vendor to victim. But that said, you know, if you think about it, this kind of ties back a little bit to what I said about um, the integrity of information. Um, information these days and data, in many ways, defines our reality. We are a data-driven society. We've, we've come to be a very data-driven society and trust that what the computer tells us is right. Um, the computer is always right. Not necessarily. Uh, that's why there are bad people out there that try to um, make the computer not be right, and that's where cybersecurity comes in. But if you think about patient data and uh, sensors in the hospitals, um, medical uh, drug dispensers, uh, computer-controlled drug dispensers in hospitals, again, um, the computers only know what they're, what they're reading and what they're told to know. Okay, so we have to ensure that the inputs going into these systems is clean and correct and the integrity is maintained so that we're not inadvertently causing patient deaths or allowing them to happen because somebody from the outside was able to wirelessly hack into a hospital and change all the morphine drip dispensers to uh, you know, go, go full bore. So the integrity of the inf of information, particularly in an incident response and in a medical sense, is absolutely critical.
looking at IT uh, across the EM uh, emergency management spectrum, we should never, never forget the concept of resilience, operational resilience. Can we remain functional even in the face of adversity? And if we can, to what degree? Oftentimes, uh, uh, you know, years ago, organizations, when they were hacked or a problem occurred, they shut down because they didn't know what to do. They had no way of staying functional. Nowadays, we're thinking more about the idea of resiliency and being able to keep some revenue, some money flowing in, some ability to maintain operations and allow our our business, our agency, our mission to be accomplished, maybe at a lesser speed and with less money coming in per hour, but we could still remain functional. So the idea of resilience should really never be far from our mind as we think about how we plan for and respond to incidents. Uh, resilience is not just recovering from an incident. Resilience also means making sure that we're able to be functional and operational during an incident while the response is taking place. I mentioned the supply chain. Think about the supply chain and the logistics of what goes into an, inc uh, uh, an incident response. Things like uh, simple things, like batteries, wire wireless communications, basic things like if, uh, in a cybersecurity sense, USB sticks, CD-ROMs, thumb drives. Do we have the basics um, to allow incident response folks to do their jobs? Are they stocked enough that they're able to um, perform even if they run low? Are there supplies in place? We see this now with COVID-19 and the number of, of, of medical centers and hospitals around the country that don't have appropriate protective gear, okay? Um, how, is that, how has that been allowed to take place? And that's, you could argue that's a political statement. I'm not gonna go, go down that road, but the idea that basic equipment, whether it's a cyber incident or a medical incident, we should be planning for having enough availability of, of this equipment to enable responders to do their jobs. Because if you don't, then you're not, you're not thinking resiliency, and the incident not only will take longer to recover from, but the incident responder's job is much harder, harder to deal with along the way, and the losses can theoretically um, mount. Along those lines, don't just think about the supply chain of logistics and supplies. Think about the supply chain of personnel and subject matter experts, okay? In the cybersecurity world, if uh, I'm going into a new organization, if I'm hired as a chief security officer, the first thing I'm going to do when I get there is I'm going to ask somebody who, very knowledgeable to walk me around the agency through the data center, tell me what technologies are being used, what operating systems, what routers, uh, who are the, um, the network providers to our, to our organization, um, all these sort of factors. Okay? And then I want to know who in our company is able to support these, these, uh, these technologies and these processes. As I said earlier, uh, if we're an it, we may have only Windows experts on my staff, but I might have a sudden need for Unix experts. Where are they? Um, Factoring.com, there were times where I would actually pluck Unix experts from around the company to come in and join my response uh, team during an incident if we didn't have the skills in-house. So don't just think about supply as being tangible items, but think of supply to include the experts and the personnel that you might need to draw upon in um, responding, actually responding to an incident that takes place. One of the things that people don't often uh, realize is that a lot, if not some of the best scholarship on incident response and um, disasters and emergency management actually comes from social science and not the, um, the crisis and emergency discipline itself. It feels like sociology, public administration, organizational behavior, urban studies, geography, um, these are all very, very applicable to the incident responder. Again, mainly in, a, in an emergency management, you know, medical sense, uh, physical disaster type of a, set of, of a world, but a lot of this also applies to cyber. And this is oftentimes because the social aspects of our world, whether it's the individual or the organization or the institution, um, it's, it's laced through every level of the response process. Similarly, technology is laced through every, uh, every aspect of the response process. Um, so we have to have an appreciation of the role that people play in the, in, the, in the realm as they interact with the technology. Uh, we can't treat the people as separate. We've got to uh, you know, address them in the context of our broader response process. I'll talk a little bit more about the people in a few minutes, but I, I like to always mention this, that uh, you know, we have to look beyond, to be a, a well-rounded uh, cybersecurity practitioner, and certainly a well-rounded incident responder, we have to have a broader appreciation uh, for the world around us. And that means going outside of our particular domains of expertise to find information that may be useful. So that said, what is cyber's role in 
crises like COVID-19 or disasters or hurricanes? Well, simply put, we're a mission enabler. Our primary job during a crisis, before, before a crisis, during a crisis, and after a crisis is to mitigate the organization's information-based threats and vulnerabilities, whatever they might be. And that's pretty much the role of cybersecurity generally, regardless of industry or discipline. How do we do that? Well, firstly, we would employ risk-based thinking, systems thinking, even if you want to go down the road of actor network theory, whatever. But you're looking at not just the technology by itself, individual devices and firewall, uh, firewalls and routers and network designs and servers, but you're also looking at how they interact and inter, uh, interconnect with each other. And it's the relationships therein to include people that we have to be cognizant of. So again, as I said, we, we, it's not just a technology approach, we have to include the social and the human aspects as well, human factors in how we assess and evaluate risk and develop our mental model of um, the systems that we're trying to protect. System in this case is not just hardware and software. It's hardware and software and wetware. Wetware being the people involved at all levels from end users through support personnel, all the way through to the executives and the decision makers. Those three, con those three areas, hardware, software, and wetware, have to work together and be analyzed holistically by incident responders if we're gonna create a, a, uh, a workable incident handling capability. So for example, um, looking at the COVID responses, um, just off the cuff, we, have, we see drive-through centers, testing centers being deployed around the country. Uh, there are a few down here in Virginia. How is the patient data being secured at these drive-through centers that are essentially being stood up in parking lots? Think about it. What's the paper trail of the interview questionnaires? Are they using electronic means or tablets to communicate information from uh, the nurse or the doctor at the car back to the hospital or to a centralized uh, data collection point? Okay. How, how is that testing data being secured? Is it being secured appropriately? Are there tablets using, you know, are, there, are we using Wi-Fi encryption? Things like that. It, you know, very basic cybersecurity 101 uh, in, many, in a lot of ways really is what gets, what is where we fall short when, um, uh, when doing, looking back at why incidents took place. Um, I don't have hard numbers, but I, I would venture to say that many of the cybersecurity incidents that have made major headlines in the world could have been prevented by doing basic cybersecurity 101 practices and good cybersecurity hygiene. So mitigating the organization's information-based threats is, you know, our, our key goal. Secondly, our goal is to protect the organization's information from vendor to victim. And this means being able to look at things like supply chain, uh, have teams or consultants look at medical devices. How are the controls? How are pacemakers programmed? Who does it? Um, is the code in the device, the embedded code secured? Has the code been reviewed? Uh, is there a Wi-Fi chip or a Bluetooth chip in the pacemaker that somebody could be hacked from behind them while they're walking down the street? Things like that. These are not nightmare scenarios where they are in some cases, perhaps, but these are very real concerns. We have to think broadly and holistically about the entire supply chain from manufacturer all the way through to deployment, whether it's a computer or uh, an implanted medical device. Another example would be uh, thinking about a, a mass casualty event, like an earthquake or uh, blizz, uh, tornadoes or hurricane attack. Responders will rush in, or even just think about your own homes. Okay? If something happens, uh, an ambulance comes, picks you up, brings you to the hospital. Hospitals these days know a lot about you before you get to the hospital, and that saves a lot of lives. And they're doing it because the ambulances and the medics are wired and are able to send your patient vitals and information and history to the hospital while you're being driven there. And that saves a lot of time at the hospital and improves the, uh, the quality of care and patient outcomes. How is that patient data being protected? If you have a mass casualty event, are the computers and the radios that are exchanging patient data or weather data in the case of wildfires, um, is, are those information flows being protected in a way that some outsider, some unauthorized third party can't be, um, uh, causing mischief and injecting false or misleading data uh, to um, to screw the response process and mislead responders. These are kind of the things we have to consider, and it's not being paranoid. It's it's really it's being realistic because these are very likely vectors for a bad guy, whether it's a criminal or a terrorist or a nation state, 
to cause to cause damage and make an already bad situation a wildfire even worse. We don't want to make make it more difficult for ourselves than it already is. Next, the role of cybersecurity in incident response is preventing and helping guard against insider threats. And that's where we come in to to work with the security teams, HR, and, and, and other folks to make sure that those involved and touching our information and information assets have been properly vetted, and that the controls are in place, both procedural and technical, to minimize the chances of some nefarious insider gaining unauthorized access to information to cause mischief. Plain and simple. The insider threat is, is pretty much common across any organization, any discipline, any company, any sector of industry, um, and it's very, very difficult to, uh, to prevent because it requires both a technical and a social solution. Next, incident responders will also be charged with fostering resiliency, continuity of operations, um, and overall mission accomplishment. By that, I mean in developing plans and procedures for safeguarding information during a crisis, okay, and, and working effectively to respond to the crisis uh, and hopefully remedy it, we are assuring a positive outcome or working towards a positive outcome. Thinking resiliency. Many times, incident responders will identify a vulnerability in their response activities. For example, let's say uh, they people wonder why, um, you know, why they're, they're seeing some strange wireless traffic on a network they thought was secure. Well, maybe there's a problem somewhere. Maybe somebody has brought an unauthorized device onto the network, and there's now a vulnerability that they didn't know about. Okay. So being able to uh, provide resiliency and and track down sort of these, these little spot fires that pop up also are crucial. So again, all I'm say, what I'm saying here is taken together, cybersecurity plays an integral part of crisis management, emergency response. And it's not just something that should happen over here in a vacuum by itself. If you think about cybersecurity 30 years ago, it was a couple of uh, you know old guys in a basement somewhere. Then it became part of the IT department and, sci and cybersecurity was always considered part of IT and just stay in IT and you know don't tell us no, just you know go after the hackers. Now we're seeing cybersecurity evolving into more of a risk-oriented, forward-thinking um, framework that is intended to be developed and operate alongside traditional corporate and operational um, activities like crisis management. So you can be sure that when a hospital these days is dealing with their COVID-19 preparations, their IT security team and their incident responders are also looking to see how is our information being protected as we ramp up to deal with the anticipated influx of patients coming into coming into our site, and then one final um, point I would make big on, on the big picture side, I think cybersecurity teams um, generally are very useful in providing continual situational awareness to the uh, to the organization, both during normal times and then during during a crisis, uh, dur during some uh, disaster scenario. Uh, for example. The cybersecurity teams are probably the first ones, or among the first ones, to realize that there are spammers out there trying to capitalize on COVID-19 by launching phishing schemes uh, on the internet, trying to get people to fork over their, their personal information and credit card credit card numbers. Okay, when we when we find out about this, we can confirm it, and then we can start alerting those who need to know to put the word out and say, "Hey, there's a problem. This is you know." So, Bad people are doing this. We, you know, we're letting you know this is a potential issue. Tell your, tell your users. Tell your, tell your constituency. We're also able to you know, identify trends uh, and kind of see what's out there. Almost um, monitoring the news, being able to uh, understand a bit more about uh, the flow of, uh, of the world as it is, um, which, which, which is helpful. And in doing that, cybersecurity teams are also um, through their situational awareness um, activities. They tend to also be some of the first ones to notice or, stu or stumble across ideas for possible solutions and remedies. They may, in the course of their research, come across a uh, word that some entity somewhere across the world is doing work on something or other. They might get some information about it, think this is useful, and pass it along to people on their, in, in their company or in their organization that can act upon this and decide if, whether or not it's worth following. So in many ways, cybersecurity teams sir, can serve as the eyes and ears of an organization's uh, emergency management response process. Um, I found that to be very useful. 
a lot of times back in industry, when I was, um, when I got a call that there was uh, an incident in progress of some sort, one of the first things I would tell people is, you know, check the news, get online, start looking at news headlines. Are we seeing, uh, are there any political situations that may be, you know, uh, affecting our systems? You know, you may not think about it, but, you know, if you're a large company, a local protest somewhere in a remote part of the world could be launched against you and you get dragged into that protest just because um, you're a large company. So that's why situational awareness is key. And oftentimes it's the cybersecurity folks that are going to be the ones that have the time and the bandwidth to spend a little time and use technology of their own cunning to identify, uh, see what's out there, and then be able to inform uh, their hires up uh, about trends, both good or bad, that may affect their team's ability to respond. Okay, big breath. Any questions so far? Will there be any slides? Um, no, there will not be any slides. So let's kind of let's move on to the uh, to some what I call operational thoughts. Uh, and these are thoughts that I, I've I've accumulated over the years as somebody who's dealt with incident response both in the cyber world and also in the in the physical world, as I said, with hurricanes and, and natural disasters. The most important thing I could I could uh, advise people is first and foremost, don't be a victim yourself. Don't do anything that would make you a victim as well. If you think about, um, uh, if you've ever gone through um, rescue diver training, that's the first thing I tell you, don't be a victim. If you're going to go help somebody, don't let their, don't let them bring you down as well. You know, if you're the responder, you've got to be able to respond. You can't do that if you're also a victim. Firefighters, when they go into a burning building, they have the two in, two out rule. Two firefighters go in, Two were standing by the door waiting, and if they need help, those two then go in together. Nobody goes alone. So don't be a victim yourself. And speaking of don't being a victim, let's kind of talk a little bit about how we may be creating victims in cyberspace because of the coronavirus. In recent weeks, there's been a heavy, heavy push towards contact tracing apps, apps that you would download to your phone that would... Um, alert you if you've been uh, exposed or uh, in the proximity of, a, of um, others that have been uh, infected with, with, uh, with the coronavirus. That sounds like a wonderful tool, being able to know where I've been and where I've, where I've been exposed to, and uh, that sounds really great. But we're being very quick to deploy these and say how wonderful they are, and there aren't a lot of people talking about the potential privacy concerns with this. Where's all this data going that these apps are collecting? Do you want your cell phone, do you want a third-party app on your phone downloading your entire contact uh, database to some third-party server? Do you want your location history being downloaded to some third-party server? And then that data being used for presumably COVID-19 contact tracing, but what happens after COVID-19 passes? Where does that data go? Serious privacy concerns, and even some security concerns can arise by rushing to deploy technology to meet a crisis without having fully thought through the ramifications. Now, granted, online privacy and uh, uh, is an ongoing perennial debate, but I'm seeing some people, whether it's the ACLU, other academics, uh, and some and some cyber experts, really pushing back on the idea that uh, just because the app can do all this, it should be pushed out and forced on people. Interestingly, uh, USC uh, and Emory just received an NSF grant uh, to develop an app to do just this for students. And this app would then allow these schools to create a risk score for students based on what the app reports. Uh, and that could affect, maybe affect things like, you know, housing or, or uh, uh, where they could eat or things like that. That's a pretty scary uh, thought if you think about it. And in some ways, it's taking what China has done with creating a social, uh, a social reputation score, like a credit score, and applying it at the micro level in the name of dealing with uh, COVID-19 response. So we have to be very careful when we roll out new technologies in the middle of a, uh, of a crisis like, a, like the pandemic to make sure that we're doing it in a way that's safe and reliable, privacy preserving, and does not make those who use it a victim as well. Um, we're in the very early innings of these contact tracing apps, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot more coming out in the next couple of weeks about their utility and how they how the security and privacy of that data might be maintained. Who owns the data? Should the data reside on the uh, on the phone or be uploaded to a cloud somewhere? How long is the data be allowed to be accessed by a third party? 
um, forever, just for the for the uh, for the pandemic. We don't know. So again, we can't just rush in to push out products and services without thinking through some of these ramifications that could have long term consequences. Um, I mentioned um, maintaining proactive and reactive situational awareness. Very very important to just you know kind of understand your role in your situation, your status as part of a larger of a larger environment. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, you know security teams and the disaster management folks, you know, they all work in little bubbles. And then these bubbles kind of get bigger and bigger depending on the organization or what the crisis response might be. None of us are operating in a vacuum, not even in a skiff. We are part of something larger, and there were those three components of response and security, as I said, hardware, software, and wetware. We have to know how we fit into the bigger picture. And if all we understand and operate on is our little local niche, that's helpful, yes, but it doesn't do a lot towards helping support the larger response or cybersecurity effort. Make sure you've got, I mentioned plans and procedures earlier on, very important. Make sure they're not just sitting on a shelf somewhere collecting dust. If you've got plans and procedures, you know, test them out periodically, make sure they still work. Nothing, nothing is worse than having an incident take place and realizing you don't know who to call because the, the, the call out roster is, is three years out of date. And I've seen that happen. Okay. Make sure that your information about how to, who to call your processes, your procedures are reviewed regularly for currency at the very least. At the same time, you might think you've got the best uh, incident response and resiliency plan in place. And that's wonderful until it doesn't happen. I'll give you an example. On September 11th, uh, 2001, a lot of internet services uh, throughout the country routed their, um, their networks through uh, points in lower Manhattan, including my, my ISP here in Virginia. The, the towers came down, the crisis was taking place, response was happening. I still had internet access. My home office and my data center I had supporting some mission critical servers still worked. It worked for three days afterwards. I was so happy that my ISP had taken care to um, have battery backups and generators to make sure that they stayed functional. The fourth day after 9-11, I had no internet access. Can anybody guess why? And if you've heard this, this story before, don't answer. I lost internet connectivity on day four because Lower Manhattan was closed and the internet company could not bring tanker trucks in to refuel the generators powering their data center. So when the backup batteries died, they went to generators, they had three days of fuel on site, they couldn't resupply the fuel, and they went dark and brought down a lot of other internet companies as well. Again, these plans and processes exist for a reason, and that's why I said at the start, thinking in a risk mitigation systems and analysis approach, doing a gap analysis is helpful to identify these, these points of vulnerability, points of failure, um, and then work to maybe address them or find ways to minimize their impact if and when they take place. For responders, again, both cybersecurity and in person, uh, be innovative, and, you know, seize the initiative, and be responsibly agile. No, as I said, no plan survives first contact. During an incident, things are going to change, and you're going to encounter things that you've not prepared for. So what do you do? The important thing is to be, be flexible and be adaptable where you can. And a great example of that is with COVID-19, how within uh, the first few weeks of the pandemic being declared, uh, the Health and Human Services Administration uh, gave a, a waiver to, uh, to doctor's offices and hospitals, waiving certain HIPAA data protection requirements so that doctors and physicians assistants could use Skype and FaceTime, Zoom, and, and virtual technologies to conduct uh, telemedicine from home because they couldn't get to the offices and they needed to treat patients. That was a great example of the government being agile and responsive uh, to deal with something that they didn't previously consider when, um, when, when planning for a pandemic. I thought that was actually a very useful thing. Next up, um, as I say, people are very, very important. Know your counterparts. As you're thinking through what it takes to build an incident response capability for your organization, know who you're working with, both up and down, above you and beneath you and on either side of you. Uh, build relationships. The last thing you want to deal with during a crisis is turf wars and bureaucratic infighting. Building relationships will make things a lot easier and uh, operations go much more smoothly when you're trying to actually work through a response. And that's very important. We still see some friction in, in cases where uh, the federal government comes in somewhere and there's, um, 
There are um, there are various uh, U.S. laws that are that are different depending on state governors and federal federal government. But for the most part, try to reduce friction wherever you can. A big part of that deals with uh, just having good relationships and good communication with those that you're dealing with uh, in, in the response world. Okay, uh, just a few more points to wrap up here. When you're communicating risks to your audience, again, cybersecurity risks or uh, you know physical world risks, don't just tell your audiences what to do. Tell them why. Okay, if you can inform people why they should be doing something and give them a reason, they're going to be far more likely to abide by your recommendations and guidance than if you just say, "Don't cross this line." Say, "Don't cross this line because this is a hot zone and you may get breathed on by COVID nineteen patients." Now they understand and they're going to back away. Okay, uh, so know and convey the why when you're communicating with victims and the public dur uh, during during a crisis. Um, two final points really um, hit home hit home for me, and even I experienced some of this early on during uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic. Responders, be sure to take time and recharge and reduce the adrenaline rush. Incident response, regardless of what type it is, is fun. It's why we get into it. You, know, you be a firefighter. A lot of times it's because you like the lights and sirens going off, and that's that's fine. Cybersecurity, we're helping people out. All all this is helping people out. But your adrenaline will build up as a responder. And what you should be cognizant of is that after a while, you know, you start making mistakes. So even though you might want to work 30 hours at a time, you need to recharge and take time for yourself. Uh, you make poor decisions. That's not acceptable. So um, recognize the adrenaline rush during incidents, during crises, and uh, know when to scale back a little bit so that you can remain at, at peak efficiency while not burning yourself out. And finally, the last point I would leave you with in terms of some tips and operational thoughts on incident response, regardless of, of the type of incident or crisis, is one word, pizza. Pizza, because you as an incident responder and someone leading an incident response team should always be take careful to be mindful of your team's well-being first. And if you're going to keep a lot of people after work or over a weekend from a bunch of different departments, you need to set the right expectation that, that you're looking out for them, and that you care about them. So I'll, in all honesty, there are times where I would come home from work during .com, I get a call as so I'm pulling into my garage saying, we've been hacked, we've, we've lost 4 million records. I make a U-turn and go back to work. I'm no sooner out of my driveway, I'm telling our network staff, call Domino's and order 30 pizzas because we're gonna be there for a while. And they thought I was crazy. But the reality is you need to take care of those that are working with you to respond to the incident, because again, they're part of your team. It's not just about you, it's about everybody involved and only together as a team can we work to respond to an incident effectively and provide the appropriate guidance to those who need it, whether they're other responders, victims, or the general public. And with that, I'm gonna take another big deep breath and I'd like to open it up for any questions that may, that may come up here. Let's see, the chat box is a little, little full here. Um, there's an interesting debate about whether data should stay on, on phones or go with, be shared with the health authorities. I'm seeing that uh, uh, down in, in Australia, New Zealand, uh, certainly in, in Asia, and I'm sure uh, places elsewhere too are, um, are, are uh, doing this as well. And Sunita writes, batteries died. Yes, I've been in places where, uh, where batteries have died uh, during, during critical times. You're in, in mid-sentence and battery dies when you're talking to somebody on the radio. Um, huge problem, and you don't have a backup, let's say. So yeah. Are there questions? Samantha asks, can you talk about reporting security issues to higher authorities? It may be that during an incident, regular citizens find unusual online activity first. How do they best fit into the incident command system for digital security? That's an excellent question. Um, part of any... Uh, sane or I say you know, competent incident response policy process is a communication plan and being able to um, have clearly defined points of points of contact to report security issues or concerns real or perceived that then can be triaged and acted upon by by responders. Um, again, going back to my own personal experience in, in, in cyber incident response, there were times where we were dealing with uh, an old Windows, Windows virus that would spread around the world like Love bug, for example, for those of you who remember that, and we would let we would tell people file your report not with the incident response team but with our call center. Let the call center customer service reps take the report, 
triage it. And then we, as the experts, will be able to see what's going on and identify the trends. But you're absolutely right, um, uh, Samantha. Make sure we have to make sure there's a clear um, uh, contact list and reporting mechanism so that users can report to us, and then we in turn can pass relevant things up the food chain or to various entities, whether it's uh, information sharing centers or to our, our partners in med medicine or law enforcement. Uh, absolutely, communication plan is absolutely critical. Marcus asks, I want to underscore the importance of the view that cyber incident response should be viewed as any other type of incident. Emergency management should not shy away from cyber simply because it involves technology with which they may be unfamiliar. Marcus, you get a cookie. That is exactly the point that I, I, I've made when I give this talk in, in other venues, and you are spot on. There is so much overlap between cybersecurity and emergency management crisis, crisis management um, that you know there's enough room to go around. And because technology is so pervasive, as I said, um, there is definitely room for both sides to come together and learn something about the other and support each other in a mutual way to achieve uh, mi uh, mission success for the incident in question. Excellent, excellent point. Let's see, other questions. Sunita, how do you integrate cyber response with other incident responses? Sometimes an area or company has a, makes a plan, has a place for, say, an earthquake, but no integrated cyber response plan. Uh, another excellent question. Yeah, there are, um, sometimes you'll see uh, plans developed in parallel. And in many ways, it's probably best because cyber folks know cyber incident response best and earthquake folks know earthquake response plans best. But at some point, as it moves up the uh, the food chain, assuming you're part of the same, let's say, local local uh, government, okay, those two plans need to come together and be part of the the government's response. So there might be a chapter on cyber incident support cyber support to the earthquake response plan uh or or, or vice versa cyber's a mission enabler so absolutely it will be part of the uh, the local government's res response plan um you can develop them independently of each other ideally you maybe have some folks kind of cross pollinate to share insights and information but ultimately uh the agency should have one response plan of which cyber would be a part of because it would support an earthquake a blizzard a fire uh, um forest fires, floods, things like that. Uh, Tim Finan, do you see good options on privacy that allows phones to be used for contact track tracing during a pandemic? Uh, Tim, I do not yet. Um, I have my own personal thoughts on what I would like to see, but um, I don't think that's been, um, I, I haven't followed it too closely. Personally, I would like, if a contact tracing app is used, I would love to see the data remain on the phone be polled as needed, but the phone, uh, the data on the phone is owned by the uh, the customer, the end user, and the data can be controlled and uh, and removed by the end user whenever they want. That would be my starting point. Um, I, John Callis of the ACLU uh, similarly believes that, but you know, again, that's part of the broader debate about privacy uh, with contact tracing. I, I certainly do not want anybody to have uh, free unfettered access to my contact list. That to me is just um, wrong. Uh, Donna asks, are there specific COVID-19 related cyber incidences that have occurred in Maryland or elsewhere? Uh, I am not aware of any specific inc incidents other than um, spam. And I can tell just by looking at my email um, spam filter at home, um, I had 140, 147 messages uh, on Sunday. This is the last time I cleaned my spam filter out. Out of 147 spam messages, 144 of them were for thermometers and face scanners and face masks. So clearly spammers will go with the trend and go with the latest and greatest uh, incident. We're seeing phishing attacks being uh, being used uh, as well under the guise of a COVID-19 response or information gathering. So uh, again, this comes back to, again, cybersecurity 101, being mindful of what we're seeing, not believing something just because it's on the internet, thinking before we're clicking and doing all those basic cybersecurity things that um, if if done, makes it more difficult for a cyber incident to take place and hurt us. Sunita asks, what is the best way to communicate cyber concerns to immediate responders? For example, how many people know intricate details of ECPA and other laws? I, that's a good question. The problem is you don't want to get whittled down with legalese and uh, during an incident. Uh, the purpose of incident response is generally to deal with the immediate operational concerns. You don't, often see incident responders stopping to ask, wait, does this break a law? Usually it's get back in business, 
let's deal with the incident. And then afterwards during the lessons learned, we, we realize what we've done and what we should have done and we adjust accordingly. Uh, legal, the law and lawyers absolutely play a part in incident response and incident handling. Um, and that's a whole nother separate talk. But um, during an incident, the immediate concern is to get, get things back, get things operational, functional, and back to business. Um, with apologies to the lawyers on the call, um, the law and legal considerations, the more esoteric legal considerations like ECPA would probably come a, a distant second in my mind if I was a responder. All right, folks. Well, thank you very much for spending part of your uh, your lunch hour with us. Um, again, uh, the UMBC Cybersecurity Center, uh, our uh, our website is cybersecurity.umbc.edu. And um, you know, these are the kind of things that, that we look into and we try to answer and uh, explore questions like this both from a technical perspective and also from a policy and legal perspective, and certainly from an operational perspective. Uh, look, look for more talks like this um, going, going forward. Um, we certainly appreciate our, our friends and partners from the, uh, from the law school, the medical school that are, that are on the call today, and uh, wish you a very uh, pleasant rest of your afternoon, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of the UMBC and the Center for Cybersecurity, thanks a lot and have a great day.